coming to this basic epidemiology, the elements that I propose to include in this module are some basic epidemiology, especially it relevance to surveillance because that's some sort of a, a hot topic right now. The government is very keen on instituting the integrated disease surveillance project, which is a huge World Bank aided project that's going to be implemented throughout the country. So my emphasis is going to be on the basic, some of the concepts of epidemiology and surveillance. Many of you must have heard of ratios, proportions and rates, but there are differences between these three components. So we would be rather seeing what exactly a ratio, what exactly a proportion and when we go in for rates. <clears throat> I'll briefly explain you some of the concepts on incidence, prevalence and case fatality. We would see how we present your data in terms of how to put them in tables and what sorts of a graphs to use. See these are all some of the basic things in epidemiology is required as to present this data. Now let us start with the definition of epidemiology. So as defined in the dictionary of epidemiology by last, epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health related events or states in population groups and the application of this to the control of health problems. So it is a very, very precise definition where every word has an importance. See, it is study of distribution and determinants, health related events in population groups and the most important thing especially for the audience here who are here for bioethics, you do something which you are not going to use, do not do that. We are going to study uh, with the hope that we are going to help the population and to control certain health problems. So this is the classical definition of the epidemiology as such. Now let me rather bring out, see epidemiology is relatively less understood by a commoner than a clinician. A doctor is very popular, a doctor sitting in a clinical setup, a physician. See the clinician, he deals with individual patients, whereas an epidemiologist, he deals with population at large as a community. Clinician, he takes history, what happened to you yesterday, what happened, you know, how long you slept, what, how many times you vomited, all those things. He takes a personal history of these patients, whereas epidemiology, he frames hypotheses or questions about a particular event. He conducts physical examination, whereas epidemiologist he investigates. And a clinician, based on history and his physical examination, he makes a diagnosis. An epidemiologist, based on this hypothesis and an investigation, he draws certain conclusions. What happened to a physician? After he is sure about the diagnosis, he proposes a treatment. An epidemiologist, he gives a recommendation. Okay. And you follow up the patient, he says, okay, you do this, you take this for three days and you come back. Of course, most of us, we do not go back. Same thing happens for an epidemiologist also. Okay. He gives recommendation and he is supposed to evaluate the program later on, but many a time his recommendation may or may not be implemented and also very, very few occasions he gets an opportunity to go and evaluate his recommendations. Okay. So typically this is a sort of a comparison between a clinician and an epidemiologist. So the epidemiologist does more or less the same sort of a work, but on a larger scale. A clinician works with an individual patient, an epidemiologist works with group of patients in a community. So in the basic principles of epidemiology is, see there are two aspects of epidemiology. One is a descriptive epidemiology and another one is an analytical epidemiology. Okay. 
the descriptive epidemiology so you describe an event with respect to time place person so we almost tell this as a mantra any any event if you start rather keep this in your mind i want to explain that event with respect to time place and person you are through with descriptive epidemiology okay time deals with when did this happen place deals with where did it happen and person is who are all affected okay just imagine if you can get an answer for all these questions you know something about what's happening in that particular area you can describe that event very well such and such a thing happened here so and so and all were affected okay and see whether there was some sort of a clustering of it in one particular ward or town or certain villages are affected okay whether children are affected or elderly people are affected okay all those things can be there there describe before you form a sort of an hypothesis you need to have a complete description of the event okay once you have a complete description of an event then you can go in for generate a certain hypothesis and then you can go for to see which cause this and how to control them okay now let's try the take one by one see these are all the examples of some of our trainees who have rather conducted investigation in various places say for example one of our student from orissa uh, did fairly uh, it's a uh, an excellent investigation there was cases of acute hepatitis in january march 2004 and uh, see he as a first step describes this epidemic okay with respect to time so now you can see the time in the x axis so it starts from 1 uh, 104 and it goes on okay for up january to march 2004 and your y axis is the number of cases okay so what he has read this his whole thing started somewhere in on the 9th of uh, january and there were some sporadic cases then you know actually from the 13th january onwards you started rather getting large number of cases this is a the, in the description the time description of the epidemic is the one which we are depicting in this particular graph okay over the time how many cases have come this what we call that as see this cases this is probably the index case and then you know this case started rather an explosive manner was coming down coming up and then after some time it has come down okay epidemiologists call this as a sort of a point source epidemic there is somewhere at a particular point there is a problem people who are using that particular source are all getting affected okay just looking at this particular graph we can rather say the nature of the epidemic some curves may be you may go up come down and then may go up see that sort of a thing but what they know one there may be once there may be a primary epidemic and then there may be a secondary epidemic secondary cases may be coming okay so propagated multiple sources all those things you know this you will can generate certain hypothesis based on this graph this is called a an ap curve an epidemic curve and drawing an epidemic curve is more or less the first step an epidemiologist does okay drawing an epidemic curve is the one first he does and to describe the epidemiology with respect to time okay then see later on when we had rather completed this investigation what he found was there was a yeah, strike during that period by the government uh, water uh, department personnel during that strike period they abstained from work and they had not co- chlorinated the water supply okay and that has resulted in 
contaminations and you have a huge outbreak. Say our investigation started somewhere around the first week of Feb February. Then you know, going on taking all control measures, saturating this, chlorinating the water supply, they stopped the water supply for some time, cleaned the whole stuff, then chlorinated, then you know the epidemic started rather falling down. Okay. So this is the an example of describing an outbreak with respect to time, and that itself gives you some sort of an idea as something has happened in this particular period to look more carefully to generate hypothesis with respect to them. Okay, so now let's rather see the place. Place is very important. You all, I'm sure, must have heard of John Snow's cholera outbreak investigation at that point of time. See. He also systematically did with respect to place about the outbreak and he was able to find out a particular locality was getting affected. When that particular locality, when he went further into it, he said the water supplied by a particular firm was the one you know, they say in that particular area and they was able to pinpoint what exactly is the problem. So like that, in this case also our friend had done a this is a, with respect to the place, he has done a chart, okay? And in this chart, so these are all the areas, and he had used different colors for the attack rates, the percentage. The red areas being the most affected areas, okay? So when we did the coloring, we could rather see, you know, these are all areas which are not affected, and there was three particular areas with the one which got affected most. And when he probed deep into it, these are all the areas which are supplied by water from that particular water source. Okay. This gives you more strength to your hypothesis and where to look for. So you have to look for the reason, you have to look for the cause. So this leads you to the cause. It's a sort of a detective work. See, in Australia, the field epidemiologists are called this is detectives. And in fact, they advertise the program as, you know, would you like to be a detective? This is detective. Uh, apply. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so people who have some sort of a, um, an aptitude for this sort of a detective work, they get fascinated and then they come. Okay. So this is also a sort of a, a detective work. There is a problem has occurred. A theft has occurred. Now you are going as a police officer and then you have to pinpoint. <laughs> That's exactly what you are doing. These are all the aids which helps you. Okay. Now, see, you could rather see the various. See, this is what you know. Once we have a basic picture, we try to superimpose on it some of the facilities that are, say, for example, in this picture, we have now rather put the water supply sources. The green, the blue ones are all underground water supply, and then these brown ones are the pump from river bed. So you could rather see these are all the underground, and this is the only one that is a pump one. Who are all affected? Is it children, women? Let me say, for example, when there was a huge outbreak of chicken gunia, almost you know many many states of India got affected with chicken gunia. Say so it was mostly the women and the children or the elderly where they affect, uh, were affected most, mainly because they stay more at home. And this was caused by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which is a domesticated mosquito. So we could rather see a clear pattern that like mostly people who stay indoors most of the, in the afternoons are the ones who were affected most. People who go out for work were not affected that much. Okay. So like that, you know, looking at the distribution of the cases according to age, sex, and say the location, we can get some idea of what is the nature of the disease. Here we could rather see almost the, um, uh, as far as the males and females, the males were affected most, and uh, it's mostly the young adult and the adults were the one which were affected most. So, on the whole, the same hepatitis outbreak we have now described with respect to 
time, place, and person. Okay. Suppose this data is given to you. Okay. How would you move further? A descriptive epidemiology can give you some clues. See, in the general parlance, we say clues. In a technical sense, we say we can generate hypothesis. We can generate hypothesis using descriptive epidemiology. So what sorts of a hypothesis that you will be generating if you are given a data like this? Someone has come and said, yeah, there is an outbreak. I had gone and I have inspected, I have investigated, and this is my descriptive epidemiology. With respect to time, place, and person, I am giving you this sort of a data. Now, it's for you to rather generate necessary hypothesis. So one of the major hypotheses I could generate is, is people who are, see it is a point source outbreak. People who are clustering around one particular locality are the one who are most affected. So what is something special about that particular locality? Since it's a waterborne disease, now let me look at the water supply system. Is that particular locality is supplied by any particular source which is not done for the others? Okay, like that I can rather go step by step, then I can find out, yes, this is water supply. Once it is water supply, then I can rather find out why this water supply system had a problem. Then we came to know that there was a strike and that would be probably the reason like. Okay, so this is a sort of a, even within, see I have not done any analytic epidemiology on it. Analytic epidemiology are to do a specific study, an observation study, you can rather do either a case control study or a cohort study or something like that to find out, say some measures to see whether the epidemic is due to that, due to a particular risk factor. We have not done, even without doing that, we can rather come to some sort of a conclusion that this could be the possible source. Okay. See now, this is a, called an epidemiologic triad. There is a agent, host, and environment. Okay. And several factors, you see, this is a problem like, the host have several factors. The agent has several factors, environment has several factors. The combination, you see, when you do a permutation combination, you know, that could be a large number of permutation combinations of one particular combination might have given a given rise to this sort of an epidemic. So you will have to systematically slice the, all the three components of it, and the vector being playing a central role in transmitting the disease like. Say agent. Say the, your host, they depend on the genotype, the nutritional status of an individual, his immunity status, his social behavior characteristics, and the agent could be a biologic agent or a chemical agent, could be some physical trauma or sociological or psychological agents. Your environment, cause sanitation, weather, now so much is being talked about, whether global climatic changes and things and all pollution, the socio-cultural habits, and the political environment. This all comes in the, as the environment. So the combination of these three is the one which affects your final outcome or your disease status and you have to investigate. Now, what are the uses of epidemiology? Epidemiology as a science can be used to, see we saw, examine causation what has caused this sudden spurt of diseases, but sudden increase in the number of cases. Study the natural history, description of the health status of a population. If you have, see, we always have resource limitations. We have very limited resources. Where to put your money? Determine the relative importance of causes of illness, disability, and death. Okay. Suppose I am doing an intervention. Say there is a sort of immunization program is there. I am going to. I am giving a nutritional intervention. 
and I want to evaluate the impact. Say, for example, I am the uh, will be rather seeing one of the slides here. About 93 percent of uh, adolescent girls in uh, uh, the Madhya Pradesh are anemic. Okay, so when I present that particular day. Uh, findings to program people. They say, oh, it's too much. And then they say, OK, we'll give uh, iron and folic acid tablet in the school for adolescent girls to be supplied. OK, and that program goes for a year. Then later on, is it working? I'd not rather go and do an evaluation of it. So say evaluation of an intervention could be done. And identify risk factors. So these are all some of the uses. We will try to rather go quickly, one by one, about these uses. Okay. They examine the causation. See, somebody has got a good health, and he becomes ill. From good health, he's transformed in ill health. What happens? See, it could be due to some genetic factors could be due to some environmental factors, could be due to his lifestyle related. Okay? And you examine which had caused good health to ill health. This is one of the use of epidemiology, to examine the causation. Natural history, I was telling you about this chikungunya, good health and see, it was it come here, came as an explosive outbreak in the same household. Multiple people were affected, but some people were not affected. Maybe some were uh, harboring it, subclinical status. Disease as such had not rather come out, and some have disease um, uh, had the disease, and people with disease some recovered and some died. So. For a particular disease, how the sort of a history is that could be studied with the epidemiology. And the description of health status in a population, I was telling you about this example in Madhya Pradesh. It said about 94% of adolescent, young adolescent girls are anemic who had a hemoglobin less than 12. So this is a sort of a, a describing. So we, we are going to rather tell to the program manager uh, facts and figures like this. Okay, to say that this is the distribution of the hemoglobin status of the adolescent girls. See, determine the importance of causes of illness. See, there are certain epidemiologic measures, health economic measures called DALIs, disability adjusted life years, mortality case fatality rate use or the mortality rates, and See, for example, you take these three major diseases, tuberculosis, measles, and malaria. They all have huge dallies, and the case mortality rate is very high. And that's the reason the government has included these three as three important diseases in the core diseases in the IDSP. Okay? Evaluation of interventions, I already told you. Say we are going to say that in the good healthy population, we can rather have some prophylactic intervention and then rather see how many of them are protected. Or in some disease, you can rather have some treatment and then you can evaluate how many of them are cured. Okay? See now, here you can identify those sections of the population which have the greatest risk from specific causes of ill health. Say, factors associated with anemia. In a pregnant woman who visa, this is again a study done by one of our students. And see the hookworm infestation, consumption of iron and folic acid tablets, educational status, and the number of pregnancy. These are all where the factors that were studied in a univariate analysis when you look. All these factors were significant. Okay. But in an adjusted odds ratio, when you see the maximum problem is the hookworm infestation. So you can have some sort of a a ranking, which is the one which you have to address first. So, the epidemiologic approaches are, we saw about this descriptive epidemiology. Okay? Descriptive epidemiology says, what's the problem? Who is involved? Where does the problem occur? When does the problem occur? Time, place, person. Okay. Then, the next step it is, is 
is called an analytic epidemiology that attempts to analyze the causes or determinants. See, you saw in the definition of epidemiology as the distribution and determinants of health events. Distribution is seen in the descriptive epidemiology. Determinants, you need to have a special study done to find out the determinants. This is all called as the analytical epidemiology. There are different types of studies called the cross-sectional studies, case control studies, cohort studies. See, these two are broadly called as observational epidemiology. Here, you don't tie, you don't interfere anything. You are just observing what is happening. Okay. The intervention epidemiology, uh, epidemiology is the one, there is an experimentation, you are manipulating something and you want to see the results of it. The control clinical trial and all comes under the gamut of intervention or experimental epidemiology. See then, this is again no, we try to enf reinforce this particular aspect in the epidemiologists or the practicing epidemiologists in the field is count, divide and compare. CDC, we used to have a, an acronym and then say CDC. People will realize, okay, don't rather just rather count. Count, divide and compare is a sort of a mantra we give them. Okay, say for example now, the number of new AIDS cases in two cities. Okay, there are two cities A and B. In city A there are 58 cases of AIDS and in city B there are 35 cases. Can you say, you know, which is the most affected cities among these two? You, are, you, you all don't need an, uh, a lecture like this. <laughs> yes, you are true. This is what you are rather seeing is the number of AIDS cases. Count. Okay. You can't rather say whether AIDS is a bigger problem in this place or that place unless you need whether denominators. Okay. So the next one that we need is uh, something to divide the number of cases by the population. So you need to have, have some idea of the population. So I get more details about this particular event. In other words, if I am going to divide them, then I get this is 58 cases per 25,000 population per year. Whereas in city B, it is 35 cases per 7,000 population for two years. Okay. Now, if I am converting them all to 100,000 population per year, okay, then I get 232 cases per 100,000 population for city A and 250 cases per 100,000 population for city B. Okay. So, the problem is more in city B than in city A. So, count, divide and compare. Okay. See this, you know, what happens, you know, when we are really dealing with the situation, many a time we forget these sort of a small principles. People try to rather talk more on the numerators, forgetting about the denominator. This even very experienced epidemiologists, they do rather talk about only the numerators. Okay. Simple things, you know, can't rather talk anything just on the numerator, especially when you want to compare certain things. Okay. Count, divide and compare. Okay, now let's rather talk something about the three measures which I was rather telling you, the rate, the ratio, proportion and the rate. Okay, all these three are of the form A divided by B. Okay, for a ratio also we say A by B, for proportion also we say A by B and for rate also it is a numerator and a denominator is there. So, what is the difference between these three? Say, a ratio places in relation two quantities that may be unrelated. Say, the quotient of two numbers. The numerator is not necessarily included in the denominator. And what does it does? It allows us to compare quantities of different nature. One of the examples of ratio is sex ratio male is to female. How many? 
females are there? How many males are there? There are five females and two males. So 2.5 is to 1 is the sex ratio. So the numerator is different from the denominator. It is not included. Say these two have totally two different species. Okay. Yeah. So the examples of ratio are number of beds per doctor. Okay. Number of participant per facilitators. Sex ratio, which you see. These are all the examples where you are expressing as numerator and denominator, but the numerator and denominator are two different aspects. They are not, rather, numerator is not included in the denominator. Say, when the numerator is included in the denominator, okay, then it has rather a, a different a proportion, is a quotient of two numbers, numerator necessarily included in the denominator. Okay. The quantities have to be of the same nature. So you can't rather add, say, the mangoes and apples together. Say it has to be the same. So the proportion always ranges between 0 and 1. We can multiply it by 100 and then say the percentage. Okay. So there are totally four women and say two of them are 45 plus. Suppose I am looking at you know, how many women are 45 plus. It is 2 over 4, 50 percent. Okay. So, in here the numerator and the denominator. The denominator is all women here and the numerator is women who are 45 plus. Okay. So, there are examples we can either say is tuberculosis cases in a district. There are 400 male cases, 200 female cases. Suppose the question is what is the proportion of male cases among all cases? So, you put uh, male and 400 plus 200, 600 cases in your denominator. 400 of them are male, so 400 by 600. 200 of them are female, so 200 by 600 is the proportion of female in it. Okay. So we saw what is ratio, what is rate, proportion. What is rate then? Say a rate measures the speed of occurrence of healthy events. Okay. So the two, this is also the quotient of two numbers. Defined duration of observation, the numerator is the number of events observed for a given time. In one year, how many cases? We saw, you know, in CTA there were 50 and odd cases in one year. Denominator is the population at risk in which the events occur. So, you get a rate which is, see there are two cases in a year and it's 0 0.2 per year. We rather say always a time element comes into the overall result. There are several examples of rates, mortality rate, and of course the rate may be expressed per thousand, per ten thousand, depending on suppose if you are dealing with a very rare disease, it's always used as for hundred thousand population. Okay. So you multiply it by a constant, either 100,000 and 100,000, depending on, because just in order to avoid a 0 0.000, <laughs> you would rather try to multiply by a yeah, suitable number. Okay. So, I will quickly introduce you to uh, two measures, prevalence and incidence. Okay. Uh, prevalence is the number of cases of a disease in a defined population at a specific point of time. See, it is a snap photograph like not a video like this. Okay? Suppose I take a snap photo and then find out how many people are sleeping. Okay? That's prevalence. Okay? The prevalent of people who are sleeping, suppose two or three, how many? <laughs> <laughs> That's the numerator and the denominator is the total number of participants. That's a prevalence. Okay? Whereas incidence is over a period of time. Okay? The number of new cases, episodes or events occurring over a defined period of time. So you can rather probably have the defined period of time is different starting to the end of this lecture that I like to see only the video graph and then see how many people because some people may be sleeping for some time and suddenly you know with a, because hearing my loud voice may wake up and then again go to and some new people may go who are awake earlier. See this sort of a dynamism happens. Okay, So at the end of it we can rather say how many people slept it should not be 34 by 34. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. The prevalence is the number of people with the disease or condition at a specific time by the total population at risk. And you multiply by some factors, either 100,000, depending on you know, the proportion of cases. And similarly, the incidence is the number of people who got the disease or condition in a specified period of time, total population at risk. So what happens you know, when we are doing in a period of time, we normally rather take the mid-year population okay, as, as population at risk. And the case fatality ratio, see the prevalence, incidence and case fatality are the three which are used very extensively in a community survey like. Okay, what is the prevalence of a disease, what is the incidence and what is the case fatality. Case fatality is num number of deaths and number of cases are there. Divide number of case deaths divided by the number of cases. Okay, say example is in a measles outbreak, there were three, three deaths and 145 cases. So case fatality is 2.1 percent. Certain diseases for which you know the case fatality is very large, they become a priority disease like so for controlling and putting your resources. See now, of course you have done some studies. You need say to put them in a table and put them as graphs. So there are, this is one thing you know, you have done an excellent work, but if you do not present them well, okay, then uh, you know, the, the, all the efforts that you have rather spent on doing the work goes waste. Because you have to dress well, you know, I, I, I can't come in a shabby dress here. I have to dress myself, same, same thing as you know, data presented in columns and rows and tables, because you all, I need not tell you about what is a table. But generally, you know, try to rather make, say, the title clear and say this is an example of a one-way table. We have age groups and the number of cases here. And this is an example of a two-way table where age group, sex is also there, okay? Age and sex distribution of. So, but when it comes to question of graph, so one of our professor used to say, why do you need a graph? Table is going to give you all the information. Why do you need a graph? It gives you a very quick idea of the thing. Say table, I need to rather look at the individual 10, 12, this is 19 out of 10, 12 out of 25 it requires. Whereas if I put the same thing in a graph, I can immediately get an idea. So what he used to say is, a person running a a splinter, a race, when he looks at the graph, he should get some idea of it. So that should be the quality of graph. Unfortunately, what happens now is, you get very complicated graphs, even for a trained epidemiologist, it takes few minutes to know <laughs> what exactly they are, because it is so complicated the graph becomes. Please avoid complicated graphs, try to rather have very simple straightforward graph because the purpose of graph is to get a quick idea of what is happening. Okay? So this is a line graph. So whenever you are dealing with certain events over a period of time, the best graph is a line graph. So the line graphs gives you for say for example the last five years in a Kushyang district in Darjeeling, the number of malaria cases, incidence of malaria cases and incidence of PF malaria and you could rather see you know when the total number of cases increase there is a corresponding increase in the pulsiferum malaria also okay and histogram it's uh, it displays a frequency distribution okay and this we saw in our epidemic curve epidemic curve is a histogram okay of the events acute hepatitis by in Uttaranchal, this is again one of our students he did. So all very good examples of an epi curve of a point source infection. Okay. Then suppose if you want rather breakdown of total proportions into different characteristics, you go in for a pie chart. Okay. Breakdown of more than one total into proportion, you go for a cumulative bar charts. Okay. Say this is an example of a pie chart, this is an example of a stacked bar chart. Okay? And comparing proportion across group, 
horizontal bar chart would be a, a good one. Say, for example, causes of non-vaccination as reported by mothers in Bhubaneswar. Lack of awareness, child sick. So you have different causes. So if you want to just rather compare, the maximum, you know, the lack of awareness is the one. Is the reason, main reason for not vaccinating their children. Okay. By age and sex in Isol, Mizoram. And this is uh, called a spot map. Cholera cases by residents in uh, West Bengal. So this is again, you know, with respect to place. When you do a spot map, you know where clustering occurs. You could rather see the clustering of cases more among this region. See, these are all regions which are not affected, whereas this is the region which is most affected. Then you can either go and find out what could be. In many, many cases, what say after finding this, they go and inspect the pipeline. Invariably, they find a leakage in the pipeline, <laughs> which supply to that particular area. And then you know they take photograph of that and things and all and give to the uh, authorities. They immediately come separate it and it becomes all right. Okay, so at least we have half a dozen uh, breaks in West Bengal alone for this particular reason. The spot map, spot map immediately reveals what exactly is the problem. This is again an excellent map of a uh, huge hepatitis outbreak that happened in Hyderabad. One of our scholars. Uh, did a remarkable investigation, went through, you know, because different uh, agencies were working on that, and then they found the um, sewage line and then the water spray line were mixing in few places, and that was the reason for that. So, thank you very much.